Hi, it's Drake. Uh, this is going to be a kind of laid back video where I'm going to um, give a couple of shout outs to a couple of people that I've been watching and who I think deserve some more views. And then I'm just going to show some books I bought recently. So uh, first off, I wanted to um, recommend, which the link will be in the description, uh, Bookshore. Uh, he's a good guy. He makes interesting videos. Uh, his main, main, uh, I guess subjects would be like Pinch On, uh, Joseph McElroy. He makes some interesting videos on kind of more sci-fi uh, stuff too. So, um, yeah, and he just, uh, he has this ongoing project that he's working on that he got a copy of The Disconnected by Ohuz Atay, I think is how you say it, a Turkish writer. And uh, he's trying to digitize the book so anyone can read it because right now the copies are pretty pricey. So that'll be neat uh, whenever he gets that done. So anyway, go check him out. And then also I wanted to uh, recommend the uh, Spine Crackers. They're, um, I guess, kind of like a literary podcast, but then they also do have like just book videos, book reviews, or like top 10 lists or whatever, TBR type stuff. So they just made their stuff a couple months ago, just started a couple months ago. So, um, but I'd say if you, if you like my taste in books, theirs overlaps pretty well. Like they just did one on Dissipatio HG, which I just recently reviewed. So anyway, yeah, go check them out too. And uh, their link will also be in the description. So, um, yeah, with that said, I'm just going to jump into the books I bought. So, uh, yeah, this uh, the first set is just going to be from my local used bookstore. But then also, I went to a town called uh, Fredericksburg, which is about an hour and a half away from Austin. An old German town named after Prince uh, Frederick of Prussia, I think, back in the 1800s. So that's kind of neat. But anyway, yeah, they had like sausages and German bakery stuff and... Um, they also had an excellent, like absolutely excellent bookstore, which is unfortunately closing down. So for those of you who live in the U.S., I'm not sure if they ship outside the U.S., uh, but for those of you who live in the U.S., I'm going to link their A Books profile. Um, so if you're interested in any books there, uh, contact them, and I think you can get them for um, on sale. Um, but anyway, I'll uh, talk about that a little more here. So... This first book here, they definitely messed up on the pricing of this. This was 99 cents. The Power of Images in the Age of Augustus. So it's like Roman history, a University of Michigan Press. It talks, focuses on art and architecture in the Augustan age. So it's like really nice book for a dollar, not written it at all. Perfect, like a lot of photos. So even though this isn't my like specific interest necessarily, I mean, I like the Augustan age is probably the one of the most interesting times in history, but I'm more into the literature rather than like the art or coinage or sculpture, sculpture or anything. But anyway, I was like dollar, come on, <laughs> you know, if I don't like it, I'll just get rid of it or something. It's no big deal. So that's that one there. Uh, next, this is a long-standing interest that I've had, well, long-standing last few years, Njal's Saga, which is an uh, Old Norse uh, um, saga, a story, and I've, in the last couple of years, I've been watching and loving Jackson Crawford's videos on Old Norse, like Old Norse language and mythology. I've probably mentioned him a few times already, but yeah, he does such interesting videos on Old Norse. He's kind of gotten me into Old Norse too. I've gotten a few books on it, uh, the language itself, and then I've gotten a couple um, original Old Norse language copies of uh, Njal's Saga, actually, and then also the Poetic Edda. Um, so, yeah, anyway, I've just been really interested in, in Njal's Saga, I was interested in this copy, which is good because it's a cheap copy, because it's translated by Lee Hollander, and he's the one who does the translation I have of the Poetic Edda. He generally translates things in a more 
archaic language, which some people don't like, but I don't have any problem reading it because I read stuff from like the 1400s, so this doesn't seem difficult to me at all. Some people who don't really read it all find it difficult, but uh, yeah, I'm not them, so. Anyway, Nyal Saga, this is really cheap Wordsworth classic, so if you're interested in getting into, uh, I've heard this called the, like the masterpiece of the, the Old Norse saga tradition. So if you're interested in it, it's, uh, it's, it's up there. All right, and then I found a copy of The Flame Alphabet by Ben Marcus. And uh, this one had been kind of in the back of my mind. I had read The Age of Wire and String a few years ago from recommendation from Paperbird. He likes Ben Marcus quite a lot, and he's actually one of his students, kind of. So uh, that's an interesting connection there. But uh, yeah, so I had always had Ben Marcus in the back of my mind. And actually, funnily enough, I was just looking at this book, and I found that it's, actually, it's had signed by Ben Marcus. You can see that there. So... I thought that was pretty funny. Raises its value a little bit, I guess, if I don't end up not liking it. Or I guess I could change my name to Kimberly. To Kimberly in Austin, with thanks for reading, Ben Marcus. So, anyway. Yeah, supposedly like a kind of unusual family drama. A terrible epidemic has struck the country and the sound of children's speech has become lethal. Radio transmissions from strange sources indicate that people are going into hiding. All Sam and Claire need to do is look around the neighborhood. And then uh, kind of has a funny first line. We left on a school day so Esther wouldn't see us. <laughs> so anyway, yeah, Flame Alphabet by Ben Marcus. And then uh, this next one is a book I've read multiple times already, but I just needed a better copy of it. And actually, I just haven't replaced it since it got uh, ruined. Uh, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man by Joyce. So this was just the nicest copy they had at the local used bookstore. Uh, it was pretty cheap and not written it at all. Normally these books are written in and it totally ruins it. I hate seeing other people's ideas in my books. Uh, usually they're not very good anyway, so, but yeah, so just wanted to get another copy of it because I want to, whenever I read, you know, Ulysses or whatever, I always like to keep this in the back of my mind and check uh, different references or, you know, actually this is a good time to mention it. So um, in my Discord, we've actually decided to do a Finnegan's Wake reading group where uh, probably every week or every two weeks maybe, uh, on Saturday, uh, U.S. Central Time from noon to two, we will be reading Ulysses, or not Ulysses, Finnegan's Wake. And uh, so if you're interested, uh, join the Discord. That's where it's going to be. You can find the link to my Discord on my, like, about part on my um, YouTube page. And yeah, the actual uh, first day of it is tomorrow. Uh, which would be uh, March 20th. So, yeah, if you're interested, come join. All you need is a copy of Ulysses, and then if you don't have one, you can still use one online, but I, I found it's just better to have a physical copy so that you can flip back and forth and look at different things. Also, the page numbers are important. So, But yeah, so whenever I read Finnegan's Wake, I like to check on different references that you might see in A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man or Dubliners or Ulysses especially. And so, yeah, it's just nice to have another copy on hand. So that's Portrait of the Artist. And then here is where I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, bookstore. It's called Wolf Mueller's Books. And this is the book I got from them. This book was $2. Uh, a New History of the American West, published by University of Oklahoma Press. And uh, it's by Richard White. This is like, it's perfect, perfect condition, nice hardcover, $2. And uh, yeah, a little bit of a background of that bookstore. So, you know, I've lived in Austin for a few years now, and 
I had seen that bookstore because when you search like best bookstores in the area, if you search a while down, it comes up with this bookstore, but it's been, always been an hour and a half away and I just never could justify driving that far just for a bookstore, like alone. But I had always had in the back of my mind, I wanted to go there. But then every once in a while, just frivolously, I would look at Abe books for uh, like first edition Blood Meridian or first edition Sutri by McCarthy. Maybe I'd get lucky and find a really cheap one. Of course, that didn't happen. But I would always look and then I would see like multiple signed first editions of both would be at this Wolf Mueller's book. So I'm like, did McCarthy like go there at some point and they just happened to have some first editions and he just signed them or what? Because it's really rare to have that many and because they're so valuable. They're worth you know thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars for the Blood Meridian. So, <clears throat> but even then it kind of, that, that kind of put me off because I was like, well, I can't afford any of that. So it doesn't even matter if they have them. But then, um, yeah, this was spring break. This past week was spring break, which kind of explains the possibly excessive amount of videos I've been putting out. Um, yeah, me and my girlfriend decided to go on a break uh, to Fredericksburg. You know, it's like a little day trip. They have a hotel there that's an old 1940s, 50s military hangar. That's, uh, uh, you know, um, changed into a hotel. So it's kind of neat. You're right on the airport and you have like little single prop engine planes flying in, Cessnas and stuff. But anyway, <clears throat> so of course, you know, we prioritize the bookstore over everything else. And uh, yeah, it's just this old couple, like maybe late 70s uh, couple who had had this bookstore for 30 years. And we found out that they were uh, going out of business. Like, I guess around time, around COVID, they had just decided, you know what, this is a sign that we should close down. And yeah, they're closing down. So they have like uh, sale prices on everything. They do actually still have a first edition Sutri from the UK, which is kind of interesting because it was a smaller print run, so it's a little rarer. So if you're interested in it, it is pretty pricey. So if you're willing to spend some money, it's there. Um, like I said, I'll link their A-Books profile if you're interested in anything they have. But um, they specialize in like, Texas history, uh, books on the West, uh, novelists and poets of the West. They have Conrad Aiken stuff from the 20s. They have a lot of uh, first edition signed copies of contemporary writers like um, uh, Barbara Kingsolver and they have James Dickey, uh, Gore Vidal, what else? John Steinbeck. Uh, a lot of Larry McMurtry, obviously, he's a big Texas writer, but uh, yeah, they're they were awesome. They even showed me the Sutri and let me look at it. And I asked them, I said, "Well, have you ever met him? Like, have you ever met McCarthy?" And they said, "No, they'd never met him." I, and I didn't really ask too many questions because I was interested in the books there, and they had a lot of other people in there shopping too, so I couldn't really, uh, you know, kidnap them just to ask them about McCarthy. But I was wondering if they like how they'd gotten into McCarthy because apparently it had been pretty early on because they had. I guess seven months ago, that's when they started their sales and they had signed Blood Meridian first editions. They had signed Sutri. They had multiple first editions of Sutri, uh, his other books, Outer Dark, you know, anything. And I guess they got all cleaned out by some people who had uh, been knowing what's going on. But anyway, yeah, so, it's, you know, it's, it's kind of... It is kind of heartbreaking, though, to see, you know, a bookstore like that go out of business because it was excellent. It had excellent stuff. They had a dictionary of English to Arabic. They had an English to Russian dictionary. They had a bunch of stuff on, like, the history of the Civil War, American colonial history. They had a lot of stuff on Native Americans, especially, like, uh, Cherokee, Dakota. They had a Dakota grammar, which was neat. Uh, they had a lot of Mexican stuff, a lot of... Um, like travel stuff on the West, Frederick Law Olmsted, which I'd been interested in, but I just didn't get. But um, yeah, anyway, so. And I always have it kind of in the back of my mind that I'd like to start a bookstore someday. Oh yeah, and if you're interested, they do have a uh, first edition printing of 
T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. Um, yeah, it's uh, originally $4,500, so I'm not sure how much they have it on, like if they give a discount or whatever, but if you're interested in that, they have uh, 1922 T.S. Eliot, The Wasteland. And then some signed John Steinbeck, some John Steinbeck books from his own library, and yeah, just, just awesome stuff, awesome stuff. Um, yeah, so that's a new history of the American West, where I got it. And then lastly here, I wanted to talk about another book that I've been getting in kind of in an odd way. So it's The Society of Mind by Marvin Minsky. And uh, Marvin Minsky is a famous AI researcher, you know, kind of a couple generations back. I think he was born in the teen, 19 teens and then lived through, uh, he actually lived pretty long. I think he just passed away recently, like the last 10 years or so, maybe 2013 or 2015. But um, yeah, he was fa founder of the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT. He's really influential in AI and since the 50s, you know, since the start. But uh, the background of how I got interested in this book, because I had seen it several times, you know, the bookstore here uh, in Austin, they get a lot of books from classes at UT that people just sell or whatever. So they, they generally have some pretty interesting books. And I'd seen this one before, looked at it, it as kind of neat, but I never really bought it. Lately, I have been getting more into AI, um, mainly through uh, Yosha Bach, who I posted a video of a few months ago. But actually, he's who I got interested in this through. Um, you know that new app, Clubhouse? Uh, there is a book club running on this book, The Society of Mind, where they read a chapter a night. And I think it's every, what would it be? Every Thursday or Friday? But anyway, if you have Clubhouse or whatever, if you're interested, it's the Society of Mind uh, reading group. And yeah, I have a funny, I have a funny anecdote from Clubhouse actually. So I've joined a couple other AI groups. That's pretty much all. I look at AI and then like global politics or global strategy with a couple uh, really smart people. Uh, so that's enlightening. But I mostly hang around the AI ones, you know, it talks about Bitcoin, uh, artificial intelligence, natural language processing, tie in a little mathematics and physics, you know, that sort of stuff. That's what I'm really fascinated by. And um, right after school ended one day, and I was just sitting grading, I saw this uh, room open up where they were basically giving a Turing test to GPT-3. So I know book channel, you guys, just to give a little bit of background, if you already know, sorry, but um, a Turing test is basically a test where you, um, you have an artificial intelligence and you have a human. The artificial intelligence tries to act sufficiently human-like where the human cannot tell whether or not the artificial intelligence is a human or an artificial intelligence. Generally, it's through text. So uh, people have been trying to do this for a while and it's never really worked. Um, but this recent uh, like text generation program called GPT-3, which is um, done by OpenAI, um, they are definitely the best so far. Basically, the way that works is they have this um, machine learning algorithm that like reads the whole internet. You know, it reads all the books in Internet Archive. It reads a uh, bunch of websites, forums, um, news stories, all this stuff, you know. And it develops a system to recreate, uh, not really to recreate, more to create language. And... Um, I don't really know the specific intricacies of it. So if you're interested, just look up GPT-3. There are really good explanations online of it. But anyway, so you can give it prompts or ask it questions and it will give you answers. Or you can say, you know, write 
a four stanza poem in the style of Goethe, and it'll give it to you, you know, it'll, in German. Um, Joshua Bach actually did something like that, where it gave uh, uh, like a, basically a forged poem of Goethe and then would translate it into English. And he said, apparently it gave like the German that Goethe would have used at the time, you know, archaic German, 1800s German. So, which is kind of fascinating. You know, I don't know if that's true, but I, I imagine it is true. So anyway, the idea of this room was, it's kind of like a game where we're trying to give a Turing test to GPT-3. The way it works is the humans in the room come up with a question. Um, and some kinks were worked out. It was kind of kind of interesting to see like the scientific method there because um, at first it was, okay, uh, you know, Johnny, you come up with a question. What, what's the question? Or, oh, I have a question, I have a question. Okay, Ashley, what's your question? But then you could kind of tell, uh, you know, if you knew who was asking the question, it would kind of help you decide what the answer would be uh, by which person answered it. And then also, if you knew the person that was answering it, that really gave you a hint, especially if you knew the person answering it. And that would kind of tip the scales where it wouldn't be as uh, random. So uh, eventually it got to the point where you would just send your question to the guy, Mikey. He was a, a PhD at Stanford for um, AI. And so it would come up with a question and then we'd give the question to GPT-3, it would spit out an answer and then a human would give an answer. And then it was the crowd's job to decide which one is the AI answer, which one's the human answer. And it was pretty interesting because the first question was, uh, why don't they advertise microwaves on television? Or, or, you know, why don't they advertise microwaves? Because it was kind of funny because like, you know, you never see microwave advertisements. But um, yeah, so you put it in GPT-3, gives an answer and the human gives an answer. And then the two answers, the two choices, see if you can find out which one it is, just as a little fun game. So the first answer was, um, I'm more or less paraphrasing, you know, they don't have microwaves on advertisements because uh, everyone already has a microwave. So uh, why would you want to advertise something that everyone already has? That'd be a waste of resources. The second answer was, uh, Uh, microwaves aren't advertised because they are bad for your health. And I was like, you know, I guess decide which one you think is a human, which one's AI. I was like, oh my God, the first one's definitely the human. You know, that's by far the more intelligent answer. No, that was GPT-3. The human said, oh, microwaves are bad for your health. You know, it's like, that's so stupid. That's so stupid. Uh, <laughs> you know, how can shaking the water molecules in like mashed potatoes be bad for your health? I don't know. Maybe it is, but I'm just unenlightened. But anyway, so that, that was a problem that you run into where the AI actually gave a more intelligent answer than the human. So at some point, you just wonder to yourself, well, do you just assume that the dumbest answer is the human and that's the way to beat the Turing test? Where, you know, you, you just assume that the, uh, the AI is smarter so that it can't pass the Turing test because it's too smart. But then there are some other answers that were pretty obvious that it was the AI. Um, there was one really kind of striking example that reminded me of the movie Blade Runner, you know, the first Blade Runner. Um, the question was something like, what are your dreams like? Uh, or what do you dream about? Something like that. I think it was more like, what are your dreams like? And the two answers, the first answer was, I have so many nightmares, I can't even remember them anymore. And the second answer was, my dreams are pops of color with clouds. And again, I was, you know, decide which one you want. I was like, oh, wow, you know, nightmares. You know, why would, a, why would an AI bring up nightmares? There's no way. So I thought that was the human. No. And then also, like, the, the human answer was kind of stupid. It's like, that's not even real. All of your dreams are pops of color with clouds clouds, explicitly clouds. There's no way that's true. You know, you have mundane dreams where you're just like washing the dishes or driving to work or something like that. But then you have like crazy dreams where you're like hanging upside down maybe, or you're like an unembodied presence looking at a situation, or you might have like wish fulfillment type dreams or you're rich or whatever, or reading, what, <laughs> writing a poem or something. Pops of color with clouds, maybe like 
couple dreams you've had in your life are pops of colors with clouds. But anyway, I don't know. But I, I was convinced that the nightmares was a human. But no, that was the AI that like doesn't understand anything coming up with the answer like I have so many nightmares I can't remember them anymore. You know, which is like that's kind of kind of disturbing. You know. <laughs> Uh, funnily enough, there was um, uh, there was research on using GPT-3 as like a, a medical chatbot, and this was in a this was like in a test, so it wasn't an actual patient, but it apparently suggested that a patient should kill themselves uh, as a solution to their ailments, <laughs> which probably was correct, but <laughs> I don't know. You know, you're not supposed to say that, so I thought that was kind of funny. It's kind of like a disturbing angle that this AI gives. But anyway, you know, trying to cut the short uh, story a little shorter, uh, I answered the last question. The last question was, um, it was something like, uh, who is why is where is when? Who is why is where is when? That was the question. And then uh, I'll just tell you, the AI gave the answer as a question back, what is why is where is when? And um, no one had given an answer and they were asking for answers. So I was like, oh, you know what, screw it. You know, that kind of sounds like a Finnegan's Wake question. So I'll give a Finnegan's Wake answer. And I decided I was gonna rhyme uh, the answer. So who is why is where is when? And I answered, uh, For now, it was something like, for now is here and never is then. Who is wise, where is when, for now is here and never is then. That, that was my answer. And I was like, come on, I'm just handing it to you guys. You should know definitely that I, you know, this is the human answer. It rhymes. It has a symmetrical structure. <laughs> it kind of answers the question compared to what is wise, where is when. It's like, who, what human would answer that? It was nine to 10. Nine people thought my answer was an AI. I was like, what are you guys thinking? This is the problem, <laughs> you know? Uh, the AI is not the problem here, but no. And then 10 people thought I was the human answer. So technically the crowd got it correct, but I was like, oh my God, there's no way. Um, yeah, it's kind of like a crazy thing, you know, and then pretty soon I think these AIs are going to be able to start writing genre fiction because, it, you know, already it's formulaic. But um, I think we have a significant amount of time before AI starts making like novel innovations to, uh, you know, the tradition of literature or something like that. You know, there's not going to be an AI Ulysses anytime soon, so to say. I'm willing to bet on that. Yeah, you might have some sort of Library of Babel situation where AI creates a whole bunch of bullshit and then there's not going to be enough people on Earth to sift through it. But then you might have maybe in the same AI system or an alternate AI system that combs through all the trash and then finds, you know, kind of like a quality detector. We set up the AI to say, oh, this is quality, this is not quality, and then it finds quality stuff, and then it, it says, hey, check this one out, check this one out, check this one out, and we don't have to read the millions and millions of bullshit stories that it comes up with. I don't know, maybe something like that will... Might, might be like accidental innovations, but then, of course, you're going to encounter the problem that it, there, there is no human behind it. You'll have, you'll have nightmares with no nightmares behind it. You know, you'll have the, the husk of the word with no actual meaning of the nightmare or another problem you'll encounter is um, when I read books fiction specifically or like narrative I imagine the psychology of the person who's writing it and I can't help it you know like when I read even something like the society of mind I'm imagining Marvin Minsky there writing it and his language and his references you know he references T.S. Eliot and Blaise Pascal and Nietzsche and all this stuff, you know, it's just, just an awesome book really. But anyway, I, I imagine his psychology as he's writing it or his mindset or his worldview. And I do that with all the books I like. And some books are so poorly written, you can't even figure anything out about the writer except that they're stupid or formulaic or unimaginative, which is not interesting, you know, but I, I suspect that's what the AI is going to seem like. It's going to seem like it's, uh, 
empty, you know. Um, especially if you know it's AI, like if you know, oh, this is a this is an AI generated story, a two hundred page novel about, uh, you know, a romance in Mesopotamia or something like that. But anyway, so I thought that was kind of neat, and I thought it'd be worth sharing as far as uh, like Finnegan's Wake reference. So, also for those of you who are interested. And don't feel obligated at all. I know, I'm sure you don't anyway, but um, I had been thinking about this for over a year and I just decided to set it up. And uh, I thought now would be a good time since I had spring break to make some videos and I have some videos um, like in storage, I guess, to be able to uh, put out gradually so that I don't ever get behind in making videos like I have been. There won't be any more big gaps in my video making. I've decided to make a Patreon, so I will link that in this video. Um, there's nothing on there yet, but just to give a little bit of a description of what it's going to look like, I did make it like my first Patreon video that I will post on this channel so that everyone can see what it's going to be like and see if it's valuable to you or whatever. Of course, if you just feel like supporting me financially, um, basically all I'm going to use any money I get from it for will be for more books that then I can read and suggest to you guys, or it'll help me work less, which then will give me more time to read the books I already have. And then I will be able to give you guys more information. Um, but the explicit benefit from it, uh, if you do, um, become a patron for me will be uh, some of the books that I have wanted to review are so rare that I worry that if I reviewed them, you know, and of course it'd be reviewed positively. I don't like to really review books negatively. I don't think it's very valuable. Um, I fear that, you know, they only have like one or two copies for sale. And then if I review it, those will just be cleaned out and then there will be no market for the book. Um, especially as my audience grows, I think that is more and more likely. So I, my plan is to make uh, rec book recommendation videos on books that are like that, really rare books um, or books that have gone out of print and are like either one or two copies available online, or they're so sporadically uploaded that are um, put online to buy that, you know, they're hard to find. And if a bunch of people are looking for it, it'll make it even more difficult. So basically what it's gonna be is I'm gonna be posting uh, book recommendations on there for people. And if you're um, a patron on there, you'll get the heads up on it much earlier. Also, if I find, you know, let's say I'm looking for books and I happen to find a cheap copy of Darkenville's Cat or something like that, for example, I will post the link there and if anyone there wants to buy it, they'll buy it. Something like that, you know, because I, I just tend to browse books quite, uh, book sites quite often. So if I ever find anything that's cheap and interesting or worth the money, I will just throw a link over there as kind of a heads up. So, um, yeah, because actually I found a copy of Darkenville's Cat on clearance for $7, and also Divine Days by Leon Forrest for $7. Um, so, I seem to get lucky with these type of things, but who knows, the luck might run out. But anyway, that's those are chiefly the two benefits apart from uh, supporting me. So, that's just open for you guys. Like I said, I'll be posting a specific video. Um detailing it a little more, and it will also act as an example for what the book recommendations will look like and the type of books I talk about. So anyway, reminder, Finnegan's Wake tomorrow at uh, noon central time in the U.S., so translate that to whatever your time is, and it'll be in the Discord. All right, well, thanks for listening if you made it this far. Death is a gang boss. <laughs>